Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our May 2022 seminar. This event is run by the University of New South Wales, by the Group of Linguistics and Translation and Interpreting. My name is Ludmila Stern. I'm a professor of interpreting and this seminar convener, and I'm delighted to welcome our numerous audience uh, from interstate, well, New South Wales, of course, and those who are overseas. As I said, this seminar is recorded, and please, uh, we are asking you to keep your microphones off at all times. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Bedigal and Gadigal land on which University of New South Wales, Sydney stands. Today, I'm speaking from my home, which is also on Gadigal land. And as a migrant to this country, I'm grateful for the privilege of having built my personal and professional life on this land. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, water and culture, and I pay tribute to elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to the Aboriginal, and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Now, let us turn to our seminar, Interpreting at the Coronial Inquest of Theo Ayes. Before I introduce our speaker, as I said, please keep your microphones on mute. Um, I won't be able to monitor chat while the presentation is going on. I will start looking at it for your questions only after we have finished. And I will moderate the questions from the floor. Uh, so you will be most welcome to post them in chat. But please, um, it is better if you wait until the end of the presentation so I can capture all the questions. So let me introduce our speaker. And some of you, many of you might already know her. It is Camille Lapierre. Camille was originally born in France in a small Western town. She is a Nati credentialed professional interpreter, credentialed in both as a certified interpreter and a conference interpreter. She is our graduate with a Master of Interpreting, which she obtained from UNSW Sydney. You might also know Camille as an educator, and there might be some of her students joining us tonight, and also OSIT members, because Camille is the chair of the OSIT New South Wales Committee. From the start of her professional career, Camille has been an active contributor to the profession through her participation, and later, as I said, as a chair of the OSIT New South Wales Committee as well as a tutor of several interpreting courses. Her interests as a practitioner lie in every branch of interpreting, with regular work in courts and tribunals, hospitals, and simultaneous and conference interpreting for international events. And with a recent COVID situation, Camille is be, has been increasingly working remotely using remote, consecutive and simultaneous technology. She strives, as she says, for a greater working environment through dialogues with language service providers and interpretation users. And many of these aspects are going to be touched upon in today's presentation. Interpretation at the Coronial Inquest of Theo Ayes. So without, um, without waiting for any further, um, I'm going to turn to the questions that I'm going to ask Camille. And so this way in conversation, we'll probably talk for about 45, 50 minutes, uh, maybe a little bit longer, after which we will open the Q&A, the floor for your questions. So Camille, if you are ready, could you please unmute yourself? Thank you, and Ludmilla. So to begin with, I would like to ask you to talk to us a little bit about the actual case 
of TOIS. Just to contextualize everything else we are going to discuss tonight. Thank you, Ludmilla. And um, before I go ahead to describe the case, I would like to acknowledge that I am currently speaking to you from my home, which is on Darug land. And I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land from which I am talking. Now, um, this particular case, the case of Teo Aye, is a case of a missing person, a missing 18 year old who disappeared on the 31st of May 2019 in the late hours of the night after being at a bar in Byron Bay. Now this is a case that has been going on as you may have noticed for a few years already with investigations that have continued over a couple of years and the coronial inquest taking place um, in the later months of 2021. Now at this stage um, there is still no news of the circumstances of the disappearance. And this is why the coronial inquest is still continuing with the next instances in June and the findings in October of this year. Oh, Ludmila, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I'm indeed on mute. Thank you, um, partly because of my cough for which I apologize in advance. So thank you for contextualizing uh, this me. So could you tell us a little bit about what kind of a proceeding is a coronial inquest? Uh, how different is it from a criminal trial uh, to which most interpreters are accustomed? And what does a coronial inquest aim to achieve? Well, the main difference with a, um, a trial, a criminal trial, is that with a coronial inquest, the coroner's role is to find out what happened rather than point the finger or blame anyone. So the goal, the aim of these inquests is to explain and determine the circumstances of a disappearance, a suspected deaths, or in some cases, the original cause of fires and explosions. Um, so again, the goal is not to find out who is the guilty person, um, but rather simply explain the, the circumstances, which is the main difference. Well, thank you. Um, why were interpreters involved in this coronial inquest and in what language or languages? So for this particular inquest, um, we were a team of two French English interpreters and we were involved primarily because um, the members of the close family of Thiel, uh, so his mother, father, brother and grandmother, came all the way from Belgium to Byron Bay and although they did pick up some English, um, it was for their convenience that the um, interpreting team was called. There was also a German interpreter that was called during this inquest for one of the witnesses. Okay, who contacted you and how? How were you approached to interpret in this inquest? So initially, I actually heard about the inquest from a colleague, uh, a fellow interpreter who had been participating in um, helping the family communicate with their solicitor. Um, so in preparation for the inquest, so she had already contacted me to let me know that she had recommended me for um, the actual inquest taking place in December 2021, as she had discussed the recommended national standards and the fact that with 10 or rather yeah, 10, 10 days of interpreting, um, mostly in the simultaneous mode, um, we would be um, needed as a team rather than a single interpreter. Uh, unfortunately, that colleague did not have the chance to participate in this job and I was later contacted um, by a language service provider um, about this inquest and I then made the, um, the request to get a partner for this. Okay. Um, what were the conditions under which you were asked to work? And, you know, for example, were you provided with any preparation or other materials? Well, um, the circumstances at the very beginning, when I was asked to do and to participate in this inquest, um, the, the court coordinator who discussed with me um, initially thought that they only needed one interpreter 
and that I could simply do it remotely. I'm calling into the phone of the family, well, two phones actually, sharing earphones with each other and joining in with the AVL in order to hear the sound. So I had to have, and that's what happened on the first day, very unfortunately, um, but I basically had my computer joining in with the AVL, with a colleague also joining in via AVL, and on my phone, I had a conference call with my colleague at the time, um, the two phones of the family, and it was just very, very difficult. Um, and that happened on the first day, despite my requests um, in the week that preceded the inquest to you know have a better mode either to be able to go on site with my partner which would have been uh, a lot easier or at least to have a suitable platform for remote interpreting noting that the on-site um, option was much more suitable to the type of proceedings as well as given the length um, you know over 10 days over two weeks that was something that was really necessary the other reason why it was so important um, was that the inquest was something that was constantly moving. So they had a list of witnesses, a list of the events that were supposed to happen, but obviously um, they didn't always happen in the way that they were planned. So sometimes we had to go a bit earlier. Sometimes we had to finish a bit later or we had to have a break in the middle and be called later on. Now, this is much easier if you're on site, if you're able to communicate with the court officers, with the different councils so that, you know, things can happen quite smoothly. But it's much more difficult to do when you are interpreting remotely. And one of the best examples of that is that I actually only got a colleague to interpret with me on the Friday that preceded the inquest. So the inquest was starting on Monday, the 29th of November. I had news that I had a colleague ready to interpret um, on Friday, I think late afternoon. And no, um, no real explanation as to whether she would be able to actually continue with me over the two weeks or whether we would be able to eventually move on site. Now, Monday came and um, I did ask for preparation material. As um, you may all know, this is something um, we increasingly tried to do, to ask the language service providers for briefing, for information, for materials. However, I did not receive anything. And the Monday when we started remotely, um, I unfortunately did not even get the link on time. So I had to contact the provider again, asking, but they had not received, they said anything from the court. So eventually I was lucky enough that I actually already had the contact of the council for the family through my colleague who had introduced me previously. And I sent a message asking what is happening because they were all in Byron Bay. Everyone was in Byron Bay, the court staff, the family, the different councils, except us. Um, and eventually that's when I got the link and I was also told that we were originally sent the opening statement on Friday, which obviously I had not received. So, you know, coming that Monday, I just get the link about 20 minutes late with the opening statement at the same time, meaning that unfortunately I had barely any time to read through it um, and obviously not to prepare apart from anything that was um, available in the media about the case, because that was a highly um, mediatized case. So there was a fair bit of information, but nothing that was really relating to the proceedings themselves. So yeah, that, that was a shame that we didn't get all of this material um, in time to, to actually prepare for, for this job. Um just thinking about the preparation materials, or rather, the lack of preparation materials, were you guided, what were you guided by in requesting your preparation materials and other requirements? Anything in particular? So um, for me, what really guided me in knowing that I had to make those requests was both, um, I believe, my training, my discussion with practitioners, but obviously also the recommended national standards. Um, well, obviously, at the time, I was looking at the first edition of 2017, but that's something that I 
um, try to learn a bit as much as possible. And I did try to quote and cite any of the standards um, when and where it was um, appropriate to remind them of, um, you know, documentation that I might need, briefing of interpreters, um, as well as any breaks that we might need. And also, although they are still called optimal standards, um, the fact that we would be using, once we went on site, simultaneous equipment and tandem interpreting, so optimal standards one and two, and that really allowed us um, to give a much more satisfactory um, performance when we were finally able to, to be on site. And through citing those and through the support of one of the managers at um, the language service provider, we were eventually able to go on site um, on the second day of, um, of the inquest. So there were two parts to the inquest as far as from your perspective as an interpreter. One that you uh, participated in remotely and the other one on site. So my next group of questions is um, about your interpreting experience in both uh, in both sections of the inquest, on site and remote. And I will begin by asking you, so who were the recipients of your interpretation? So um, the recipients, there were well, a few, because we would think immediately of the family, because originally we were called primarily to interpret simultaneously for the benefit of the family, so, so that they can understand everything that is happening in the court, so that we are removing that language barrier and they can participate fully um, in the proceedings. But eventually the court is also one of the recipients of that interpretation, because at times um, I did go into um, consecutive mode, um, a couple of times. And at that point, um, the council, the court staff, the coroner were all the recipients of, of that interpretation. Understandably. Uh, were there any particular challenges uh, when you were interpreting in either of the modes and in each situation? So can you talk a little bit about the challenges, about your coping strategies and so forth? Yes, indeed. They... Um... There were a few challenges. Now, I've already mentioned some of them earlier, particularly the fact that we had to really struggle to actually get on site, <laughs> on site um, with the equipment, the simultaneous interpreting equipment, which we use the portable equipment um, to be able to also be away from the family. And I think that's um, that's a challenge that was, I would say, in a way, quickly solved once we were on site. Um, but that is something that was extremely important for that type of proceedings. And the main reason being um, there wasn't only the four members of the family that spoke French. There were also other members of the family that lived in Australia. So they were fully bilingual and they did not require that interpretation, yet they need to be able to communicate with the other members of the family, whether it is to determine some questions to, to ask of the different witnesses, whether it is to simply debrief about the different things. So because um, of that particular setting, um, it was much easier to have the equipment so that they could be as a group, they could be there talking to each other if needed, removing, you know, the earphone to be able to communicate with them. But at the same time, I don't have to stop interpreting. I can continuously interpret simultaneously, you know, alternating with my colleague and um, I can do my job as well further away from them because it is quite an emotional and a sensitive case. Um, so if I am in the middle of four people or more, that is not quite a comfortable position to be in, um, whether for the family or for me, professionally speaking, I like to have that little bit of distance so that I can actually do my job and I can, you know, ask my colleague if I have a question, or if we need to review a certain term. Um, and uh, I think what I can do as well is I'd like to quickly share a screenshot um, from the um, inquest, because as you may already know, that inquest has been live streamed on YouTube. So all um, 10 days of the first part of the inquest, which happened on site. And then there were three days that happened in February, which uh, happened 
partly remotely with the family being back in Belgium. So yeah, so this is um, a screenshot that I took of day nine. And here you can see briefly the setup of um, the courtroom that we were in, in Byron Bay. So that's quite a small courtroom. And um, so here at the back, you can see um, myself and my colleague with the interpreting equipment. You can see the microphone in front of my mask. And so we were at the back of the courtroom. Now, the main reason why we were at the pack um, is because on that very first day that we arrived on site, so day two of the inquest, um, we actually tried to ask for a desk, a chair, and a more suitable um, working station for us to be able to have our notes. However, we quickly realized on that first morning that the sound in that very small courtroom was really traveling well when we were in the middle. And because of that, it was becoming an inconvenience for um, the courtroom, for the staff, and we were even asked at some point to perhaps move to a, another room in that court and to continue to do this remotely with the phones. When I heard that, I was shocked and I immediately um, talked to the court staff and the court officers to try and convince them that this was not going to be as suitable, that phone connection um, you know, is not a suitable way to um, conduct this type of interpreting, particularly simultaneous, um, and that we needed to be in the courtroom. We could try and modulate our voices more. We could try and move ourselves into a corner of the courtroom. And indeed, that's eventually what happened. And it was, I would say, more comfortable for the court. Maybe not the best situation for us still, because we obviously um, didn't have a workstation. We simply had the chairs at the back. But um, it was more suitable eventually than us having to move into a different room. And after that first morning, everyone was very happy. We were able to modulate everything and it was um, much easier. But that's something that, um, that was quite difficult. And here you can see at the front, so the four members of the family um, that spoke French. So the grandmother, the mother, the brother, and the father. So they were the ones who were using the interpreting equipment. And here on the second row, um, these are members of the family that also speak English. So you can see actually that it's quite interesting that we were on the back row. And therefore, at the very beginning, the members speaking English found it a little bit difficult because they could hear constantly um, that whispering in their ears in French, although they did understand the English, but the courtroom was so small, there was no um, other space for us to be. And they would rather be together because obviously they're the main members of the family that have traveled from Belgium. So it was more um, appropriate for them to be at the front and for us to be at the back so that they could communicate with each other. Now, to give you just a little bit more context, so here um, the two members at the front, and there's another person who was there, is the team assisting the coroner. So in this type of inquest, um, the coroner has a team assisting them in order to ask the questions of the witnesses and to bring the opening statements and to do any um, examination as needed. Then we have here standing the um, solicitor for the family. And on the right, we can see another um, solicitor who was there to represent the commissioner of police. So there were the three parties asking questions um, after each other during this inquest. And um, the family had obviously an opportunity if needed to talk to their solicitor to ask more questions as arising. Now in the bottom corner, we can see one of the witnesses um, at the time. So that was, you know, the first challenge for me was really um, being able to have appropriate working conditions that is working on site with my colleague with simultaneous equipment and getting documentation and materials. Now, the second challenge of getting those materials, um, well, the strategy that I used, I would say, is to insist, <laughs> insist continuously <laughs> every day, double checking whether or not there were materials that were going to be read out, um, whether the witness list had been updated, um, whether for the particular expert witnesses, we were able to get 
their statement. Now, most of these requests um, were not necessarily met with a refusal, but the main issue was sometimes that the brief of evidence for that particular case consisted, if I remember correctly, of about 12 volumes. So 12 volumes, um, you know, all in big cardboard boxes. And therefore they explained to me that they just could not give me everything. So I tried to narrow it down as much as possible, asking for you know, important witness statements, particularly for witnesses that would be heard over an entire day, um, expert witnesses because of the terminology, um, as well as the witness list so that we were more aware of what was happening in the day. And um, eventually I obtained all of these documents but I would say that it wasn't without a fight <laughs> and it wasn't without my continuous requests, which were actually mentioned back to me by um, some of the members of the, the staff, you know, noting that I did ask numerous times. However, um, for some of the documents, they had to get special permission. And I understand that takes time. But I think the main reason for this was the fact that we were um, we were contacted for the assignment too late. Now, when I originally received the request, I received it two weeks before the start of the inquest. Now, you noted that the inquest is something that is pertaining to an event happening in 2019. The dates of the inquest had been decided, if I remember correctly, around September of 2021. It actually started on the 29th of November. So there were a couple of months. There were more than a couple of months to actually um, contact us, to be able to, um, you know, make the requests and so on. However, we've only two weeks and it actually took me about a week to get the contact details of the court to be able to start discussing my requirements. So really, I only had about five days, five working days to organize everything, to request certain things. And unfortunately, the line of communication wasn't really ideal um, at that point. So... Of course, some of the things, if they had been asked earlier, would have been easier to obtain, um, even with the special permissions needed from the court, but that wasn't the case. So I would say, yeah, that was probably the, um, the second challenge. The third one, if I can think um, of one, was really the, um, the switching between the different modes and sometimes the difficulty of getting acknowledgement um, for some of our requests. So for that particular case, um, so most of the time we did interpret simultaneously. And I want to stress as well that the court officers have been really wonderful with us um, in getting us the hearing loop in making sure it was um, charged every time that the battery was not running out. Um, also talking to us during breaks every now and again when things were getting a little bit emotional or a bit difficult checking on us. And that's something I really want to um, acknowledge because it's not all the time that we get court officers that are so um, understanding of our role and of um, things that we have to face. But for the rest, sometimes it was a little bit difficult to explain, um, you know, how we would need to work, how we would need to proceed. And this is when I quickly realized that the coroner's court is not as accustomed to working with interpreters perhaps as other courts and tribunals, which led perhaps to that first um, suggestion of using phones <laughs> to call um, the, um, the, the, the people on directly in order to interpret. But um, also that sometimes I had to re-explain, for example, that when we have a witness who may need some interpretation into French, that I cannot just wait for them to ask me and leave my colleague to interpret everything simultaneously, not knowing whether or not they need to stop. And um, for that, I'd like to actually share a quick excerpt from the inquest. Now, I have a few of them to illustrate a bit what I'm talking about. Obviously, I tried to select short excerpts as much as possible because as you knew, it's a very, very long inquest. Um, most of the recordings are about six hours in length with a lot of the adjournments actually recorded on there. So if you want to learn more or have a look at more of the inquest, uh, feel free to have a look um, on YouTube. They're all ready for, um, for you to be able to watch. But I just want to share in particular 
the one in, on day five. So day five of the inquest was the first Friday when um, one of the witnesses um, for um, who was a, a friend of the family actually required um, the help of the interpreter for French. So I'll just put it around the correct mark. Hopefully my screen is coming through. Yeah, wonderful. All right, so this um, is what was happening. So this is what people could watch um, when they were watching the live stream. So here we had the witness on the right, the courtroom on the left. And you can't actually see me, but I'm already in the witness box um, right there. And so we had also um, a screen share that was happening at the same time. And I just want to um, share at that particular point. So after about 50 minutes, the witness, um, who we had determined could go through the interpreter because it was easier for us to manage in terms of the, um, the interpreting, making sure that everyone could understand what was happening, actually makes a request to go back into English. And I have to also note that it's very late where that witness was. I think it was around midnight or so, um, meaning that they had to listen to the same question twice, once in English, which they could understand, um, and once in French again. So I'd like to just uh, for us to listen to this and then I'll make a few comments. 31st of May. Et donc ensuite, vous voyez qu'il y a trois messages que vous avez répondu à Théo à 18h33 heure de Belgique. Oui, j'ai juste deux petites remarques. La slide qui est affichée, en tout cas sur mon écran, n'est pas la bonne. Et euh... Aussi, je trouve ça un peu parfois compliqué quand les questions sont claires. Pour l'instant, je comprends bien ce qui est répondu en anglais et ça me... le fait que vous soyez en train de traduire à chaque fois, ça me ralentit un peu dans... Enfin, j'ai peur d'oublier ce que j'ai envie de dire. Et je pense que je serais capable de continuer en anglais. Um, yes, but I'm noting that the, the slide that I'm seeing is not the right one on the screen and also when I'm being asked the questions because I understand the questions in English and then it's being interpreted and so that makes it a bit slower and so I'm afraid I'm going to forget what I want to say so maybe I could uh, answer in English. Uh, I'm content for this, yes. Your Honour, if Your Honour is. Certainly. So here I just want to pause this so that witness makes a request to go back into English um, and obviously everyone is very happy with that because they can then understand directly, that's not an issue. But one thing that I immediately notice is now I have to stay there on the stand because she might require interpreting from time to time, which is something we had discussed previously. But on top of it, now I'm staying in the witness um, box, so I cannot interpret simultaneously at this point. And my colleague, who we see very, sm in, very small in the background, would have to then interpret everything simultaneously. Now, we don't know for how long that um, witness examination is going to go Come for. on. And um, oh, can I just ask that all microphones be muted, please, just so that we avoid any background noise for everyone. Thank you. So, um, Yes, so the main issue there was that um, my colleague could not interpret for a very long period of time without any support and I could not just get off of the witness stand because they might ask me to come back. So for the proceedings to go smoothly, we had to then determine a solution. Now, um, one of the councils assisting the um, coroner actually made a suggestion to then go um, question answer in English and then for me to interpret consecutively and this is something I then agreed to because again in the heat of the moment at that point I thought I do have the skills to interpret long consecutive um, I can take notes so I will try my best to do this obviously trying to remind the court whenever they were going beyond that now I must say a couple of times they did forget to let me interpret and so I had to interpret two, once, three questions and answer. Um, but generally speaking, um, the main reason this had to go this way was for the family's sake, because obviously the family has to be able to um, hear and understand what is happening. And it was just the most suitable way to do this at this particular point. 
Now, I just want to share um, another quick excerpt from this, which is when um, there was actually a particularly long segment um, by the witness. And at this point, I'm taking a lot of notes. And when I'm taking notes and trying to focus on the message, I don't always think about raising my hand. And I do assume that in some capacity, the, ju the judicial officer will make a move to support me by reminding um, to pause for my interpretation. Now, in that particular case, they did not. They did do it at a few times. But I want to share um, this one where there was actually an acknowledgement by the judicial officer, so by the coroner at this point, um, after I interpreted um, that long segment. So I believe, yeah, the segment I interpreted was about over two minutes. So that's telling you how long um, that went for. And we have, I believe it's around here. Yep. Seconde du, de l'émission Burger Quiz, ça m'a surpris parce que ce n'est pas quelque chose qu que normalement on va s'asseoir, on va aller à la plage et puis commencer à regarder. Donc ça m'a surprise. Peut-être qu'il montrait ça à quelqu'un d'autre. Mais je ne peux pas, je ne peux pas croire qu'il se soit dit ben, il y a un nouvel épisode, allez, on va le regarder comme ça. Well done. <rire> So here you can um, hear the coroner saying, well done, and everyone sort of smiling, giggling a little bit because uh, it had been about over two minutes <laughs> of interpreting from the notes. And I must note that one of the um, counsel assisting the coroner was also speaking some French. So they did know usually um, when I did need to, to interpret. But um, yeah, that's one of the few times when we were more acknowledged um, during these proceedings. And I think that was something that was quite um, important because we were a real part uh, of these proceedings as much as any of the people you can see on the screen because we were constantly there. We had to be there every day. We had to make sure our equipment was working, that the family was hearing us properly, that we were monitoring, you know, whether we needed materials, whether we needed them to sometimes slow down. That is um, another, I would say, maybe uh, the last challenge I want to mention. This is the speed. Now, in this particular case, because we had um, we had a witness that needed interpretation at times or who wasn't as fluent in English, it was a little bit slower and much easier to manage. But as soon as we had a witness speaking English with the council speaking English, it just went at an incredibly fast pace. And that, despite my numerous requests during break to slow down, they sometimes during breaks made small jokes saying, oh, well, am I speaking slow enough? And then others saying, oh, well, I think so, but maybe the interpreters won't agree. And <laughs> now I understand um, sometimes it was simply a bit humorous, but um, the main um, issue that I sometimes explained was to tell them with examples that French is in general about 20% longer. 20% longer, that, that might not seem huge to them because they think French and English are quite similar, but 20% is a lot of words. And um, despite the fact that we might speak French relatively fast, you don't wanna to speak too fast because otherwise people will really struggle to understand. They will really struggle to um, absorb whatever information is being interpreted. That was even more the case during those really fast examinations, when sometimes the topics were a bit difficult and the questions sort of fused. And then we were left trying to interpret this into French with about 20% longer. And I actually gave an example at one point to the, um, to the, the team assisting the coroner, because they, at the point, did not seem to really understand what I was explaining. And I gave the example of the word upsailers. So there was a talk about upsailers in that, in that particular context. Um, at that time, I needed about six words in French to render that word. Now, again, I'm giving you that without the whole context, but that was the idea. So I needed about six words. Now, six words for upsailers in English, where people would say upsailers, upsailing. It's quite quick to say. Now, Imagine if I have to say six words multiple times, even if I try to shorten it uh, and I try to avoid repetition, it's really, really fast for people. And sometimes when talking to the family, double checking, 
whether or not our sound was good, whether or not this, the pace was understandable for them, um, especially after an expert witness statement, which was particularly fast. Um, they did tell us it was really fast, but we understand. We understand because they were there and therefore they could tell that it was really fast already in English and that we were just doing our absolute best to um, you know, render that message into load. So yeah, I think those, those main challenges are getting those materials, being able to be on site, um, managing the different modes with the everyone in the court and, and the pace were probably the main ones I wanted to highlight. Mm. It's fascinating, Camille, you mentioned at the beginning that interpreters, as we know, are often an afterthought. So you were booked at a very late stage and nobody even considered your requirements as professionals and you had to struggle very persistently. So congratulations on achieving a lot by constantly approaching the court personnel. And I will come back to the court staff, to the interpretation users a little bit later. And then you mentioned that there was a certain degree of awareness and even a praise from the coroner. Um, is there anything else you would like to say about the change in what we call interpreter visibility at different stages of interpretation. And I'm not asking you to, to repeat what you already said, but this level of awareness maybe by different um, interpretation users, um, how often could you intervene and ask them to slow down? Uh, did you shy away from interrupting them too often and so forth? Yeah, I think um, I think this is a very good question because we talk so much nowadays about the interpreter visibility, the awareness of um, the interpretation users. Now, with the the family in particular, obviously they were very aware of the of us, uh, of making sure that you know uh, the equipment was working. We were double checking before um, every uh, every day started with the court officers, they were very aware because every day after we requested the hearing loop, they just came with it perfectly charged. They took it back during all of the longer breaks, making sure that it was working well. So with those, um, with those participants, we really had a greater visibility. And I believe with the family now, you know, they are aware of what the interpreters do, of what we can do under which circumstances which is always good as well to be able to, in a sense, educate the public about what we can do as interpreters. And we're not just there to, you know, we're not there to give advice. We're not machines. <laughs> we are obviously doing our best under the, um, the circumstances that we're given to work. For um, the rest of the um, participants in the court, particularly um, the staff, the different councils. Now, I would say that there was a greater level of visibility once we were on site. And once we were able to approach them with every break, um, because I would say that I think almost every break I approached someone, whether it is to ask about the pace, whether it is about asking for documents, um, informing them that maybe this time the pace was much better. So not only just asking things, but also noting when the things were done better, when we were able to access the, the right um, materials, when we were able to have the right equipment. Um, I always made a point of also mentioning those so that they know that this is something we would like for them to continue. Um, and, um, and I think that, you know, overall that brought a greater visibility to, to our role and what we need, but there's still work to be done. Um, and the main reason for that is that at the very end of that inquest, of that first part of the inquest in, uh, in December, I did mention both to the councils, the team and the family, that if they did require an interpreter or interpreters for the second part, which was going to happen in February, that it would be best if they could contact their language service providers or inform the court as soon as possible. Now we knew the dates on the 10th of December. I did mention that to multiple people. Yet in that second part of the inquest, which started, I believe, around the 22nd of February. Um, I was uh, emailed by the council of the family um, 20 minutes before the start 
of that day, asking whether I might possibly have some time to help. And, you know, my immediate response is, well, not at this time. I mean, I did have other commitments. I knew that the inquest might be happening, but it's not my role to chase them, to double check whether or not they need an interpreter. I mean, this was already a high profile case. We had been there for two weeks and it was not unknown that interpreters would be required. Even if the family is overseas, I did mention that there were, you know, ways for us to be able to interpret. Yet, you know, this is the type of email that I received. And once I explained that, the language service provider contacted me saying, well, if you're not available today, are you available for Thursday and Friday? And, you know, I looked at the request and in the request, um, you know, I saw that they might be considering including a, um, a platform for remote interpreting. But that wasn't really selected at the time. They were thinking of remote ways. And so I mentioned that there were platforms where, you know, obviously not everything is ideal, but they might need to discuss um, that with the court, seeing what's possible again at very, very short notice. And again, I was not available on the Thursday. I obviously had other jobs, other assignments and other commitments like many of us do. I mean, it's quite rare, especially if you're a very busy practitioner that you will be able onto the spot to take on, you know, two days of work, three days of work um, for large cases. And so I did agree for the Friday, but I did talk to the managers and people at the language service provider to make sure that this time we had a suitable platform and we had better work conditions for um, remote. I said, if it is going to be AVL and phone, I am not doing it. Um, this is not appropriate. And on top of it, the family's in Belgium. Although I have a phone plan that allows me to call into Europe, <laughs> um, it's not appropriate. It's not appropriate working conditions. And so um, I had a few calls on that Thursday morning, afternoon, and eventually I was told that we were going to use WebEx, which was a platform that the court um, could use. And for that Friday, because it was supposed to be a short day, I was on my own again because of the short notice. And it only lasted, um, if I remember, I think it lasted about two hours or less than two hours um, with a few breaks. So eventually it was manageable and I was able to use that WebEx platform and, you know, the family could hear me. But again, a remote platform is not ideal. And the main reason for that was that, um, well, the family had to set up two computers, one hearing me on loudspeaker and one uh, where they actually joined the court via AVL because on the previous days they weren't joining via AVL which means no one was seeing them so they were there but they didn't have any visibility which was important um, for this type of case but on the um, Friday which was the last day of that second part they were able to be visible but as soon as they unmuted themselves at some point because they wanted to quickly um, you know talk because at that point they can't talk even I can't really interpret for the court because it's only a one-way thing um well you know <laughs> because of this um at some point they forgot to mute themselves again and so you could hear my voice <laughs> coming through um the courtroom because of their second computer so you can see you know there are ways, but it's still not ideal. It's still not polished. And there's still so much more to do if we want to have appropriate um, working conditions with remote and court. Now, video interpreting is obviously so much better than phone interpreting for court, <laughs> but we're still not quite there yet, especially when we have to do long assignments. And, um, and yes, yeah, so in that particular case, um, this, is, this is what happened. And... Um, and the, the other thing in terms of visibility with remote, the main issue was, as I said, so the family is on a separate computer with me and with a um, court staff who's managing and hosting that session. Main problem being, well, no one sees me. No one sees me this time. So no one even thinks that I'm interpreting. And at some point when they were checking for dates, um, they were asking, you know, when it's suitable for the family. Well, I'm interpreting all of this. And you can see actually that they're responding with thumbs up, with, you know, large nods. 
but often the court is wondering whether they need to communicate a different way because they forgot. I, I assume at least they did not have as much awareness that interpreters were actually present or inter actually interpreting for the family. So I think that um, you know with remote we still have a lot of work to do if we want the interpreters to be acknowledged. But that doesn't mean that when we are on site, <laughs> that um, you know it's always any better. I mean, at the very end of that of those two weeks of inquests, despite having been there in the background for two weeks, once the thanks of the coroner were expressed um, to the family, to the councils, well, the interpreters received nothing. <laughs> um, we did not hear a single word at that particular point in time. And the first thought of my colleague and I were, well, that's a bit disappointing. You know, it's not like we weren't there, we weren't present, we weren't actively asking for things. Um, yet, you know, we were in the background, so we were sort of forgotten. Now, um, after we finished everything and we actually returned to the airport to go back to Sydney, um, we saw the team of the coroner again because everyone was obviously coming from Sydney. And that's when they actually mentioned, sorry, you know, oh, we forgot at the time, but thank you so much <laughs> for having been there and so on. And I, I did appreciate um, those words very much, but I wished that they were said um, in front of everyone, that it was a more public acknowledgement because we were part of that inquest as much as any professional that was in that courtroom at that time and you know and we were doing a very big job with very little preparation <laughs> with um you know not the best and the most appropriate working conditions especially from the start with you know having to constantly ask for materials for you know for the pace for all these things so i think that we are getting better, but it's still not anywhere near um, ideal so far. It is ironic, isn't it, to think how from having, I wouldn't say high profile, but high visibility during the inquest, then suddenly um, interpreters are again forgotten and falling, fallen into oblivion. Um, and it sounds like the technological nightmare has contributed to it, especially in the remote setting. Now, uh, Camille, as we are heading uh, to the end of our conversation, I still have two important, well, three important questions. One is about um, the lack of preparation materials, because I remember you mentioning at some stage that it was a very technical inquest, and I'd like you to uh, speak about it for about a minute. Uh, the other one is um, the emotional impact, because as you said, it was a very emotional uh, case. So I wonder about um, you experiencing any secondary vicarious trauma because of the subject matter, and if so, how you dealt with it. Well, um, to start with your first question, um, it was technical in many um, in many respects because we were talking about geofencing. We were talking about um, you know the positioning of data coming from different services, from telco, from um, from Google, from so many different aspects. And these are things that obviously we had gathered from our, I would say, preparation um, with you know media articles and so on. But once we went to, for example, an expert witness examination, well, everything is so much more technical. And that particular expert witness statement we received, if I remember well, um, a few minutes into the interpreting of that segment. So we had asked for it um, repeatedly. And because there was a court order on it, um, it was more difficult to obtain. But once we obtained it, we received an email saying that we had now the right to see it. Problem being when you're interpreting simultaneously, you're not checking your email. <laughs> you're not checking your email and your colleague won't necessarily think about checking their email immediately either because if we haven't received it by the start of that segment, we just assume we will not get it. I mean, unless someone actually tells us, hey, finally, we have been able to send that to you. If you want to have a look, 
no, that that did not happen. So um, yeah, it was it was quite technical, and we managed as much as we could with the knowledge that the family had been heavily involved in the searches and in all of that discussion. Meaning, some of the English words were perfectly understood by the family. So we did not necessarily need to try and find those equivalents that might be less used or quite new. For example, like geofencing, things like that. We just used um, the word, like we just used the borrowing and, um, and that was understood by the family, especially because again, since there were two parts, so the French speaking and the bilingual parts of the family. So they were often talking and using a bit of French, a bit of English mixed together. Obviously we're not trying to do that during the entirety of our interpreting, but for these very technical aspects, sometimes we did have to. Um, now for the emotional impact, I mean, it was an extremely emotional case. Um, if you do watch any parts, um, I can indicate some of the parts um, that might be more interesting, again, because it's a very, very large amount of, uh, of recordings and of hours, but I would say that I did feel, obviously, the emotions, particularly on the very last day of that first part of the inquest, day 10, when I had to interpret the family statements. Now, those family statements usually come at the end of, a, in the, of the inquest. Normally, that would have been then after the February part. But because the family had traveled all the way um, to Australia, they decided to do the family statements on that last day. And that was particularly difficult. That was difficult both because we wanted to make sure that those words were um, rendered in the best way possible to reach um, the English speaking um, staff and other participants in the same way that they would have understood it in French. And therefore, you know, that was a lot of pressure to make sure that those were um, rendered uh, in that way. And we quickly discussed with my colleague who was going to do it. And we agreed that I would take um, that part of the interpreting primarily because I managed emotions in a better way. At least that's what we discussed, mostly because I usually I try to always put some distance. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I try to put some distance both physically and emotionally when I'm doing interpreting. I mean, that's essential when we have to interpret difficult cases, you know, sometimes trauma, murder. These things are very difficult to hear when we're just a member of the public. And when we're interpreting, we're really in the heart, in the middle of all of these discussions, sometimes with very crude details, with very specific information. And I sort of put a wall between myself and the content I'm interpreting. So it's not meaning that I don't feel any of these things, but perhaps as well because I was a bit younger than the family, I don't know whether that helped, but I know my colleague did mention because she was closer in age to the mother, the grandmother, um, it was more difficult for her to uh, distance herself from those emotions of, you know, losing um, an 18 year old son. So I think that in that sense, I we discussed because we got the, the statements, we received the statements from the family after we, you know, obviously kindly requested them uh, at the beginning of day 10, they provided them to us during a break and right before lunch. And we basically spent our lunch going through those statements, looking at the best way to interpret certain words um, to make sure that the impact would be the same uh, as intended. And, um, and yeah, when it came to the actual statements, we discussed with the family, making sure that we would have, you know, appropriate breaks in their statements so that we could interpret and still make it feel like, you know, they are giving the statement rather than doing the whole statement or half of it. Um, and different members had different strategies. Some decided to go sentence by sentence, others with a few sentences. And I think that with, um, with all of them, what I did was actually, I, um, I had a copy of those statements on my phone, whether it was a document or a photo. I asked the permission from the court to be able to have my phone with me where I was sitting. So I was actually facing um, the, the bar table. 
uh, and I was lower. I was not in the witness box. I was asked whether or not to sit with the, um, the member of the family. I asked to be in a separate area, both because, you know, it was their time to deliver their statement and it was recorded. So they had the camera on them and I wanted to make sure it was them uh, who, um, who were recorded. And so with that phone sitting there, I had that copy and then I had my notepad in order to note any changes because they did make a couple of changes during um, over the lunch time. So that way I was able to focus on the rendition more than on the note taking. Um, and that really helped to make sure that the, the message came across in the same way. And I must say at that particular point, there was not a dry eye in that courtroom. Um, and when I was seeing all of the faces looking at me, um, you know, staring at me while I was doing um, that, um, that consecutive interpreting. It was particularly moving, but I think until the very end, I kept it um, as professional as possible. But I must say, once we had a quick break, I did have a tear or two that came up because, you know, all of that pressure suddenly builds up and then um, comes out. But right after I just, you know, went back into my professional um, self, and we were able to, to finalize this. But I would like to share a quick um, excerpt from this day because um, to me that really shows how much these, this consecutive interpretation had the impact that was desired um, because we had the, um, the, the coroner who actually um, needed a break. So I will just try and put it over there. Yeah, for 25. Here we go. Okay, so this is um, right after the all the family statements um, have been um, done. And uh, if you want to listen to them, um, feel free to have a look. Um, but here I just want to share that small part. Um, that was an extraordinary experience. Um, for me and I'm sure the other people in this courtroom. Um, everyone in this courtroom these last two weeks has felt your pain. But what we've experienced also um, through these last two weeks and so much so today and hearing your words is your love. It could not be clearer. It's made me very emotional. I may not be able to speak. <laughs> I'll take a short break and I want to continue. So I wanted to share um, this very short excerpt to show that, you know, obviously being able to render those statements was extremely important because everyone, whether they were watching on the live stream, but all of the participants in the courtroom, they were relying on the interpreters at that particular point to be able to hear and understand the words because the full statements were done into French. Um, so I interpreted each of those statements one after the other into English in consecutive. And, um, and yeah, these were the words of the coroner. And again, um, what I could see from the councils as well was uh, quite a few tissues being used. And to me, um, despite the, the fact that we only had a very short time to prepare them, only, you know, the hour of lunchtime, being able to go through them, making sure that we had the right words. Um, you know, the reaction of the coroner just told me that I had done my job. I had managed to transfer and to transmit these emotions. Obviously, you know, we all feel the emotions of someone, no matter the language they might be speaking. But I was able to still keep those words um, and keep that emotion in there without sounding like a parrot, without, you know, um, going over the top. And that was extremely important for me. For me, that was one of the biggest rewards to make sure that what I had done um, had transmitted that emotion, had rendered that emotion um, for the English speakers as much as it felt for the French speakers. And um, 
and this happened as i said so just a few minutes before we finished everything so this when we talked about visibility this was even more um impactful for me when we did not hear anything about the interpreters actually the mother in her statement thanked us um for uh, for our work throughout the inquest and although i understand you know obviously the emotions were there and so on this is maybe why that impact of the the fact that we were sort of um you know forgotten was a bit stronger for me at that point because that recognition also helps um i believe practitioners to to value you know the work to value um what they've done and to see that you know they're not just machines you know standing behind just sending all of the information no they were human beings and at that particular point when we had the break the court officers um they came to us uh, to our team to double check whether or not we were okay whether we had a debriefing um, methodology whether you know we would actually have a service because they said they did have one at the courtroom um but they were wondering whether we would as well and um and this is why i want to perhaps in that same regard stress that for an inquest to me tandem interpreting is not only useful it's essential especially for long cases it's essential because at each and every time that we finished interpreting for a particular day we were able to debrief together we were able to talk um, about it. We were able not only to review the technical aspects, the words, the vocabulary, but also the emotion. Um, and I think that was really important in order for us to sustain ourselves um, during those two weeks. So that's perhaps for me, one of the biggest messages um, for long cases, for long proceedings. I mean, two interpreters should not be, in my opinion, an optimal standard no matter the language, whether it's TI, B, C or D, it should be the norm. It should be the norm because simultaneous interpreting, if you've done some, if you've trained for conference interpreting, you know that most people switch after about 20 to 30 minutes. Now, yet we are asked to do six hours or more of simultaneous interpreting in a courtroom by ourselves with all of the emotional impact all of this um so that's for me one of the messages i wanted to um to send across with this particular um, discussion and me i'm speechless and first of all i'm sure you know how proud you should be of the quality of your interpretation and everything you have achieved as an interpreter and also for the profession and the industry. But also it was a gripping presentation. And also thank you for, for the conclusive lines of recommendations. Um, I now would like to invite our um, audience to write questions and comments. I will start, I will go right to the beginning and I will be reading out any questions that I come across. Um, so please bear with me. Uh, there was a question about the category, uh, about a cat, uh, uh, recommended standards category uh, in the, uh, on preparation, but I think it's something everyone should be able to uh, look up. Uh, there was a question, was the interpreters needed for the communication between the family and their lawyer? Um, yes, a good question. Could you answer, Camille? Um, no, definitely. So um, they did require um, interpreting, you know, during their preparation meetings. Now, during the actual inquest, and because they had bilingual um, members of the family, often they would be able to uh, manage themselves. But I did interpret whenever the for example, the counsel for the commissioner of police wanted to say a couple of words to them at the beginning of day 10. Um, then I, I performed that um, before we started the, the live stream. Okay. Um, any more questions? All right. Uh, there is one saying, how, uh, okay, how did you handle multiple, sorry, it jumped. How did you handle multiple family members on site 
when doing whispering interpreting. And I think you spoke about it a bit, Camille, when you showed the slide about you sitting at the back and the family sitting at the front. You might want to add something else to it, perhaps. Yes. Um, so, yeah, perhaps I haven't necessarily made it um, extremely clear, but so what I was using was um, simultaneous, portable simultaneous equipment. So um, what we had was four um, receivers. So each of the family members that required the interpreting had one with um, their own headphones, earphones, or the ones provided. And um, my colleague and I had two transmitters. So the way that it worked was they all had the receivers. They had the choice to, you know, listen or to just take off their earphones whenever they wanted to communicate um, with someone else. And that way, I think it it was much more manageable than if we had to do the traditional whispered interpreting, which is sitting next to someone, usually um, close enough to their ears. Um, and that also allowed us to be able to modulate our voice much more because they could simply increase the volume and we could speak as low as possible in order to avoid background noise for the court. Thank you, Camille. Camille, as I'm reading through the questions, there is such an overwhelming expression of gratitude and admiration for your presentation and your work. Um, now, the next question, how long did it take for you to recover emotionally afterwards, after the intense two weeks, and what did you do to help yourself? An excellent question. You know, thank you, and thank you for the, um, the expressions of, of gratitude as well. Um, I, I believe that after that, I took the weekend and I in the weekend actually in between the two weeks I was able to return home and to take those two days to sort of um, have more of a relaxing time not thinking so much uh, about the inquest and that was something that did help as well um, for me to manage and after those two weeks um, as I said I think that perhaps um, I, I don't want to seem heartless but in the, by having that distance, by having that wall, mm -hmm. it sort of protects me from um, feeling too much of that emotional impact. Of course, I feel, you know, sorry for the family and for their experience. But as an interpreter, I have to interpret for many different cases that cover many different types of, of issues of, you know, of troubles that people are encountering and if I tried to keep everything to myself all the time where I was emotionally impacted all the time that would be very difficult so I think that you know I just took a couple of days to and do something different um maybe you know I, I think I can't remember exactly what I did but I knew that because it was around the 10th of December that we finished um, after that, I was looking forward to my holiday at the end of the year, <laughs> um, and um, and I think that helped to sort of put this um, aside and um, and not feel too affected. Thank you. Um, the next question really relates again to emotions, but in the moment, in here and now. Can you talk more about how you manage your emotions when interpreting? in difficult situations. And I would add to it, you know, what prepared you for it? Is it your personality? Is it your training? Is it something else? Um, well, I think um, that for me, the obviously the training did have an impact um, because when I trained to, to become an interpreter, I did the, the master of interpreting and I was only doing interpreting. I wasn't doing translation as well. So everything was about interpreting, about managing not only the, um, the terminology and the techniques, but also how to manage, you know, vicarious trauma and all those things. And I think that part of it might be my personality, but I'm actually uh, someone who's quite um, sensitive and I'm, I actually have a lot of emotions in my everyday life but when I have sort of my professional hat on um, to me that's just a different side I just know that at that point um, this is my job this is my work and um, I dress professionally I try to act and speak in a professional manner and so for me it's sort of like a persona that I'm putting on like now I'm this interpreter I introduce myself when I go in I um, when someone is trying to tell me, for example, in a courtroom that I can wait outside until I'm needed, I say that, you know, I'm an officer of the courts. Um, the, you know, it will actually be helpful for me to have some context. Um, and this is the way that, you know, the way I present myself 
um, really helps to put me into that persona and differentiate between my personal life, my personal emotions, and, um, and you know, what I have to do professionally. Excellent. Um, another question from Cynthia Camille. When you did the remote interpreting, I understand that you were not visible to the court, but were you able to communicate with the court? Uh, for example, if you needed a word, sorry, jump. Uh, for example, if you needed a word repeated or some clarification, or if you had a technical problem, were you in any sense present in court? So I think with the, um, the first time we had um, the remote interpreting, so on that very first day, um, of part one of the inquest. Um, the only way I had really was just to unmute myself because I was joining via AVL. So there was that option. And actually, if you do listen to day one, at some point, my colleague comes on to um, the AVL out loud by mistake because of the fact that once you reconnect, the microphone is always on. So that was the best way that we had because we could not communicate otherwise um, other than by email. With the um, WebEx platform, when I did that in February, uh, I was in contact with someone from the court um, via the messages. So that's the way that I was able to, to mention anything. However, I must note that often they were busy, um, I'm sure maybe doing other things <laughs> because at times I did ask a couple of questions and they were not answered. So I do assume that, you know, either that was put on the side and, you know, checked on a regular maybe basis, I'm not quite sure, because again, I could not see them on the AVL. So I was not able to physically see the people that I was communicating with, only the courtroom and the courtroom could not see me. Um, so that's why, you know, it was a lot more difficult to communicate. And for that type of case, um, I was very, very um, happy that eventually I was able to go into the courtroom on site for that first part, because otherwise, it, to me, it would have been near impossible to render um, the messages in the way that I was able to do. Thank you. Uh, there is a question. What was the finding at the end of the inquest? What was the cause of death? As far as I understand, it's not over yet, is it? Exactly. Um, so there is still um, oral submissions that will be uh, in June, early June. That's the next part of this inquest. And then the uh, the findings will be in October of this year. So um, from what I have understood, things will continue to be live streamed. So if you want to hear more, I'm sure the news will pick it up, but you can also have a look um, on YouTube to, to find out. And it's a rare opportunity to actually have a proceedings, especially interpreted proceedings in the open domain. Uh, I must say, yes, this is actually part of the reason um, I was really keen on on sharing this experience, because as interpreters, most of our assignments, as you all know, um, are to be kept confidential. The information has to be kept confidential. But in this particular case, everything is in the public domain already. Everything has been shared. Um, so I thought this was a perfect opportunity to um, show more insights into the work that we do in courts and tribunals uh, and highlight perhaps some of the, um, the better work practices that we can either request or ask for. Okay, um, I want to read a couple of comments. Uh, sorry, it's jumping because we have more. Thank you, Camille. Such an interesting insight into your profession. And thank you for advocating for the right of interpreters in the court. Fantastic work. Transmitting emotion is so much more important than the words. Um, and another comment, I hope the fut in future you can do your work without all the difficulty you faced and worry about your delivery um, as all professionals in the courtroom do. Interpreters should be equally respected to perform and not struggle with all these challenges. And this is, of course, that we are all advocating for and are hoping for the better. Absolutely. Um, yeah. um, Camille, says Angelo, uh, were there any discussions later on with the coroner on whether this had been the first time uh, she had worked with interpreters and whether she thought other coroners had received any training about working with interpreters? 
Um, well, thank you, Angelo, for that question. I wish at that particular point, um, maybe I took the time, but because, um, as you know, with most judicial officers, we hardly have any contact with them. Usually it's through the court offices, um, whether, you know, it's a criminal proceedings or, um, or others. And in that particular case, once, you know, the court was adjourned, the coroner just went back to, um, to their chambers. So the only contact I had was through the team that was assisting the coroner. And they're the ones that are mostly communicated with throughout the entire inquest. Now, I did take the time to discuss um, the standards briefly with them. At times, I did mention, um, you know, several things that I've, that I've talked about before, about the pace, about the working conditions, about things that we needed. Um, but I wish that we had had the time to actually discuss this further because on the last day, um, as I said, you know, everyone kind of went really quickly because we all had flights um, to, to get on to, to go back to Sydney. And when I did see the coroner and her team back at the airport, you know, everyone was, you know, relaxing at that point, waiting for their flight. And perhaps, you know, after their thanks, I did not necessarily think about um, discussing this further. I mean, we were all sort of unwinding, um, I think, from uh, from the very intense two weeks. And I must note as well, and that's something that um, was a critical part in, in, in the inquest as well, this was at the same time as the schoolies. So oh, okay. this means that, you know, the airport was also really really busy um, because everyone was returning from Byron Bay and you know during the entire two weeks this was something that we were very aware of when we had to even just go out to relax because everything was taken over um, so yeah that that's partly the reason I mean the airport being so packed I did not it did not cross my mind to start having a discussion um, on this although I wish maybe at some point I had had an opportunity <laughs> Uh, Camille, there is a question which um, is about ethics, really. Do you keep in touch with family or are you not allowed? So um, I do not keep in touch um, with the family. I mean, in general, I do not keep in touch with any of the people that I interpret for, particularly in, in um, legal proceedings. Um, However, um, I have interpreted after that uh, for them, for example, for their discussions with their solicitor. So I was contacted later on to assist in that regard. And I do continue to do my work, my professional work in that sense. But no, I don't talk. I don't join any of their, you know, Facebook discussion group. Like I, as again, I keep it as separate as possible. I only said a few words to them at the very end of the inquest, simply expressing my sympathy, but leaving it to a very short um, expression because again, I'm there as a professional. And um, although I must say that in the courtroom, many people were a bit closer um, than they would be in other legal proceedings, partly because this is not about finding anyone guilty. Um, so the atmosphere is more about supporting um, the, the family. But I try to keep myself as neutral and, and as distanced uh, as possible while remaining respectful for my own um, emotional, I would say, protection as well, so that I don't become too involved. Uh, and I think that that was helpful. Good, good. In a way, you are, you are supported by the Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. Um, before I read the last question, um, I want to read out Brida your thanks to Camille. Thank you so much Camille for telling us how you present at courts to ensure that you are treated as a professional and recognized for your skills and role. Great insight and I yeah. can only I can only echo echo that. And um, thank you and I want to just say regarding that that this is something I was I was taught as well during my training which is you know the way you present yourself um, is extremely important um because that's the way people will then be able to to treat you um and so despite um for example my age despite my appearance i do want to be seen as just you know a young interpreter who doesn't know much i come across straight away i express that i'm a professional interpreter i express what i need to get and because of that no one in during that inquest um viewed me as any less of an interpreter uh 
than, for example, my colleague who was visibly, um, you know, older and therefore many people might have assumed more experienced. Um, I think that to me, the fact that I presented myself straight away and I went in and I always took the lead for those requests and made sure that I was then treated as a professional to a certain degree, as I said, <laughs> there's still things to be done. But in my work in general, I've never been seen as anything other than a, a professional interpreter um, if I present myself appropriately. Mm. Um, before I read out the long question, and that'll be the last one, there's a short one. Which university did you do your training at, Camille? Yes, so um, I did my training at the University of New South Wales. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I had great teachers who have really taught me that importance of, you know, being professional, knowing my the requirements of the profession and, and everything. And this is partly the reason why I'm able to take on, you know, such cases, even though I don't have 10 years of experience. Um, I haven't done, you know, 50 trials, but uh, whatever I've learned is supporting me every day in being able to assert my um, my rights and what I need as an interpreter and uh, and thanks to that I've been able to build I think quite a good uh, experience in many different domains. And it also shows how well you did in different configurations on site remotely consecutive simultaneous site translation short consecutive long consecutive amazing so here is our last question and we only have oh, almost <laughs> uh, not even a minute what can we do to showcase the way a court interpreter works and the requirements of court interpreters to do their job with the quality and standard you have demonstrated in this matter? Can your story be shared with the legal profession and with the courts? It would be an eye opener for them. So, well, thank you, um, Cynthia, for the question. And I'll try to be as brief as I can because this is, you know, this is a large question. Um, I mean, part of the, the work that I've done is, for example, to discuss with, with others, with other practitioners, with Ludmilla, you know, on how we could share this experience with others. And um, at this stage, you know, I think that by sharing this story, by sharing this experience, hopefully, you know, discussions can be um, had later on and, you know, move on to maybe other legal practitioners. Um, at this stage, I'm I don't know exactly of the best way forward, but this is why I'm doing such um, such a seminar. I'm hoping that maybe amongst our audience, we have people that will be able to help, you know, further um, our um, working conditions that will help further our visibility. And I think that, you know, this is the first step um, forward and hopefully there can be many more in the future. Ami, once again, thank you very much. And please, everybody, join me by, um, you know, you can show your appreciation uh, through signs, through whatever you like. Um, again, thank you so much, Camille, for a gripping and a very inspiring and very informative um, presentation about your experience of international ramifications and international resonance. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you everyone for being a wonderful audience once again and for your comments and your questions. And uh, we will meet again closer to the mid-June. We are going to jump again uh, to the International Criminal Court and we will talk or we will have a presenter who will talk about uh, how International Court deals will with multilingualism. Thank you very much again to everyone, Camille, and all the best. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a great evening. Bye.